this morning I thought I might do a few hopefully very short videos, two or three minutes each, and put them together into a little bit longer, but on slightly separate subjects as a kind of cleanup for some comments and questions that people have asked over the last uh, few weeks, primarily about uh, one or more of these uh, Digilent products. Uh, once again, I say I don't have any connection to Digilent. Uh, I bought all of these things at their price and uh, and I don't receive anything from them, but uh, I do like this uh, equipment. Obviously I now own three of them. The uh, Digital Discovery is the newest one. The Analog Discovery 2. Uh, I bought uh, about maybe a year ago or a little less than a year ago and the original Analog Discovery I bought more than a year ago. The question that this first video is going to look at is I speculated in one of my videos that it would be nice if you didn't have to use separate computers for each analog discovery and one of my viewers uh, kindly replied and said that he had actually found that you could use more than one uh, Digilent discovery product on the same computer. So I'm going to try that now. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is plug in the Analog Discovery 2 and then I'm going to go over to the computer and start it up. Here is the screen and this is a Windows 7 computer. I start up waveforms and you notice that it goes through a cycle and detects that I have the Analog Discovery connected. Now what I'm going to do is slide this workspace up here in the corner and then I'm going to plug in my USB hub. This is an old hub by the way, a very early USB 2 hub, a generic, so should work with anything. I chose this one because if it works with this it'll probably work with any hub. And plugged into that is my Digilent uh, digital discovery. So we plug that in, it senses it, and now I'm going to open waveforms again, a second instance. And you'll notice if you watch the digital discovery videos that the menu that comes up shows that it recognized that it's a digital discovery that's now connected and everything seems to be working normally. And by the way, I have tried firing up scopes and things and uh, each one works independently. Now I'm going to plug in my original analog discovery, that is the one that I sometimes call the legacy, the first analog discovery, and I'm going to fire up waveforms again. And you notice that it senses the uh, that analog discovery as well. So I have three discovery instruments. Two of them are analog discovery. This is the analog discovery original. This is the analog discovery 2. And down here is the digital discovery. So uh, thanks to a viewer who uh, <laughs> was willing to try this and I don't know why I didn't but anyway uh, he put me on the right track and I appreciate uh, his comment and it uh, I can confirm that you can have at least three I assume you can have as many of these as you own open at the same time. Now I'm going to go back to the digital discovery and this little real-time clock module that uh, I showed in a previous video at the time, I didn't show this in operation except for the fact that you can power this up using the power supplies in the digital discovery. So what I'm going to do now is power this up and, and then go on to do the, let me turn on the supplies here. 
and you see the power is on and the real-time clock is powered up. So now let's go over and look at the display and see what we can do with the protocol analyzer. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch. Uh, this comes up in the UART. I'm going to go to an I2C because I know that this real-time clock is an I2C device. And I'm going to click on Custom and then Example. And the example I'm going to use is this example, which says find I2C device or devices. And it'll actually find a bunch of them. Click on that. And then I'm going to do execute. You see that it found the address of this device is 5A. So the next thing I'm going to do is go back to simple and I'm going to enter the address. You see I have hex 5A in the address. And then what I'm going to do, I have already changed the number of bytes to 31 because I know that this device uh, uses 31 bytes. And so we're going to do a read. And you see it said NAC after address. That means it's not working correctly. And one of the things I discovered is I don't have the uh, reset line set up on this one. So what I'm doing to reset it is I'm just turning the power on or off and then back on again. Now let's bring this back up and let's do another read. And this time you see we got the correct 31 bytes out of the real-time clock. Now, I won't go into the details of this particular one. I think this uses a, uh, let's see, a DS1302 by Maxim is the, is the actual clock chip on this sensor. But what I was trying to show here is how you can sort of go about figuring out what you have on your bus. That is, by using the custom setting and by using this example, which finds an I2C address, you can determine what the address is, and then if you go to whatever you want in terms of either a simple read or write or uh, a sensor, if you have a if you have a sensor and so on, and I've I've ordered some sensors from Digilent uh, to go with their chip kit board. And at some point in the future, I may do a video on those. But right now, I mainly wanted to show you this. The, this particular sensor came with a kit from SunFounder for the Raspberry Pi. And so it's not, it's not one of the sensors that is in the examples for the digital discovery. This is the PMOD for the advanced, or I'm sorry, the ambient light sensor, uh, the, the gyroscope, and so on. They, they don't have a lot of examples in, in already in this. I'm hoping that at some point they'll add some more, but at any rate, this is, uh, if you don't find the example for the particular sensor or, or bus device that you're working with, then the simple way, at least the way that I did it, was I went over to Custom, called up the Find I2C Devices example, ran that to get the address of the device. And by the way, if uh, it stores an, an entire array there, you notice that the uh, uh, it stores as many addresses as it finds. So then I go to Simple, and enter the address right here. And now I can write or read from that address. Let's try another one and see if it's going to require another reset. Yeah, NAC after address. So we'll turn the power off and back on to reset it and do another read. And this time, once again, we get the correct data back. So I uh, hope this is useful and is a little supplement to a previous video in which I mentioned the protocol analyzer, but I didn't really talk about it very much. There are some good videos on the Digilent site about using 
this. For example, the uh, sensor video I think that's on the digital side, at least the one that I saw, is this PMOD ACL. That is the ADXL 345 module, which is the peripheral module for their chip kit uh, board. So, uh, enough about the protocol analyzer. Another thing that I'd like to mention that I didn't in my earlier videos is the difference between the connector on the Analog Discovery, including the original and the Analog Discovery 2, and the connector on the Digital Discovery. It may not be as obvious from here, but there are more pins on the Digital than on the Analog. And that is reflected in the cables. You may notice, if I put these two cables down here together, that they're not the same height. And this cable is for the digital discovery, and this cable is for the analog discovery. Now, it is possible, I suppose, to try to plug this one into the digital uh, discovery. Obviously, this one won't work because it's too wide. But if you try to plug this in, what you will discover is that the pins don't quite line up. And the reason is that the center, in this case, if you can see the, the place where the center is, the center is lined up a little differently on the digital discovery than on the analog discovery. So at any rate, don't try to, to mix those up. Also, if you have one of these little B and C boards, I mentioned earlier that it won't work with the digital discovery, but here you can see that one of the reasons it won't work is because it has the wrong number of pins and frankly they're connected to the wrong things. But the other thing that you need to watch out for is unlike the flywire connectors, which have this little uh, guide tab to keep you from putting them in upside down and things like that, this one has no such tab. So it would be possible for someone to, to actually insert this into a digital discovery. So be careful. Keep your analog discovery e equipment and connectors separate from your digital discovery. The last area that I wanted to touch on is the fact that, like all instruments, the uh, digital instrument and the digital discovery as well as the analog discovery have some impact on the signals they're monitoring. So what I thought I might do is show you a little setup here. I'm using a Siglent pulse generator or actually an arbitrary waveform generator set up to generate a 1 megahertz pulse with a 10 nanosecond rise time. I think that's what I've got. A 50 nanosecond pulse width and a 10 nanosecond rise time. And I have it coupled over here and then I'm using this Rigol scope that I'll show you in a second. So right now the analog discovery is is hooked to this and I point out this is the analog discovery but it's the digital input in other words the logic analyzer input it's displaying that pulse now let's look at that same pulse and you can see that it uh, shows a peak-to-peak -peak voltage of about three and a half volts and uh, a rise time of about uh, right at 10 nanoseconds. Now the peak-to-peak -peak is because of this overshoot. The actual generator is only putting out about a 3 volt, but because of cabling and impedance matching and other things, we're getting an overshoot. If you'll notice, the this is a volt, this is 2 volts, this is 3 volts. So if you see, it settles to 3 volts, but there is a, a almost a half a volt of overshoot on the signal. Now pay attention to this point as I disconnect the analog discovery 
and you see that the overshoot becomes sharper. What that is telling us is that the analog discovery is, is, is applying some capacitance, which of course we should expect. All instruments have some capacity, uh, especially in their uh, test leads. In this case, it's just the fly wire from the uh, analog discovery. So we're getting a sharper uh, point. And if you now look, let me zero in a little bit better on that rise time. You see that it now says the rise time is 9 nanoseconds. And that's largely due to the capacitance of the analog discovery. Now, the analog discovery is not really designed to operate in the, you know, one or two or three nanosecond rise time range anyway. So just be aware that connecting the analog discovery, the same as connecting any instrument, is going to have some effect on your signal. Now, if you're doing logic analysis, it usually is this small amount is not uh, worth worrying about. It's much more of an important problem in, in if you're doing analog measurements and you're trying to use the fly wires. I recommend that if you use the analog discovery for analog measurements, that you get the little plug-in board that converts the inputs to BNC connectors and use X10 scope probes. But at any rate, I, I'm not uh, didn't want to go off on a long tangent having to do with this. It's just that the input characteristics of the instrument need to be considered, particularly when you're trying to make finer and finer measurements. So this was just intended to be a kind of cleanup video of a few issues that people have brought up in their comments. I hope it's been useful to you and I hope you'll look forward to uh, some more along similar lines or at least using the same instruments. In the meantime, have a nice day.